Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. If you've come looking for my more usual live action roleplay or costuming related Chaos Goblin content, this time we're doing something a little different. Hopefully you'll still enjoy this much gentler, more cosy video for a change, and if not, I'll be back next time with another exciting instalment. This story begins back in the before times of 2019, when I made a coat for a LARP game and in the process stumbled upon a fashionable craze in late Victorian patchwork and a small new obsession that slightly took over my workroom. From some time in the 1870s through to the early 1900s, there was a trend for patchwork utilising random shaped pieces of precious fabric, often expensive, brightly coloured and mismatched in both colour and texture. While some magazines refer to this as kaleidoscope or Japanese patchwork, more on that in a moment, the name that stuck was crazy. It's not clear whether this meant crazy as in chaotic and wild or as in crazed like porcelain. I think the second one is a little tenuous personally, a lot of the primary sources I could find definitely leaned towards the first definition in their descriptions. As with many textile arts, information on the subject is a little fragmented. There is plenty of information on the internet and much of it quotes the same facts, but digging into link after link I found a lot of circular references and unsubstantiated information. A deep dive into more primary sources would take more time, resources, and probably access to a number of now out of print books on the history of quilting and patchwork than I have. What follows is what I believe to the best of my research to be true, but take nothing here as concrete fact. This style of patchwork certainly doesn't appear to exist much earlier than the 1870s, and its rise is popularly linked to a recent influx in Japanese art, although I have opinions, and I'll get onto that a little later. It does seem to have started among elite women, although later it would move further throughout society and be limited to soft, mostly unquilted textile items for the home. But a lot of the information in the early days of this practice comes from published magazines offering patterns and tips. You see, the preference was very much for silk and other high quality fabrics, except that in the late Victorian period, seeming to be high quality did not mean actually good. Some unstable dyes and a lot of silk weighting, treating the silk with metal salts to make it stiffer and heavier, made a lot of these fabrics extremely unstable, and of what survived falling out of fashion, many heirloom patchworks seem to have deteriorated beyond repair. It's hard to say therefore whether this practice was in fact as popular as the magazines made it out to be. Was it actually the 1880s equivalent of spray painting pairs gold and arranging them in a bowl with some expensively sourced driftwood? We just don't know. But my personal feeling, based on everything I've read and the surviving examples, is that it was at the very least something many people knew about and potentially aspired to do, even if they didn't have the time or resources. You could find lots of references to using scraps from old clothes, especially if you could get a local figure of note to donate a piece of their clothing, and other important textile items in these patchworks. Or fabric waste sold directly from mills and workshops once the practice got more popular. So while recycling was never the original point of these projects, it does seem to have been a happy coincidence. The Victorian technique for this patchwork was somewhat different from the streamlined modern version I'm using here. Victorian crazy patchwork was done by hand. Guides, again, usually from magazines, suggested arranging the patches with lapped edges until you were happy with the layout, before turning the edges of the upper pieces under and embroidering over the seam. And I do mean embroider. I have some experience in cruel embroidery, and there is a lot of complicated decorative stitches that I recognise, and quite a few more that I don't. This was elaborate, time-consuming hand sewing. Given that I have basically no experience of patchwork but a decent amount of experience in embroidery, you would assume that's also the technique I would choose. But whether this footage gave it away or whether it was the elaborate, time-consuming hand-sewing part, I did not. Crazy Patchwork saw something of a resurgence in the late 1960s and 1970s, where it appeared on clothing for, as far as I can tell, the first time. Since then, it seems it's been gently practiced, never as popular as it was in the 1880s, but a thing people were definitely still doing, in a streamlined, modern form that makes excellent use of everyone's favourite invention, the sewing machine. <laughs> 
To be clear, at the time it was extremely popular, Victorians did have sewing machines. They chose not to use them. I respect that, but I will not be replicating it. The basic principle of modern crazy patchwork is to line up the raw edges of your scraps right sides together on top of a backing piece, so a straight line wherever you want the seam line to go, and then flip the top scrap down and iron it flat. You then cover the raw edges with another scrap and, well, rinse and repeat a million times. Despite being much quicker than the Victorian version, it's still fairly time consuming and takes some practice. When I was just starting out, I often found in the process of flipping things back and forth, the angles didn't turn out the way I wanted them to. Or I'd miss raw edges and end up top stitching pieces down to cover mistakes. I've definitely improved through making a number of different projects. Here I'm using one of the two main patterns I utilize, working from one end of a long narrow strip to the other. I definitely recommend this for beginners if you want to give it a go. It's the easier of the two as you're only working in one direction. You'll see the other pattern a little bit later. I do also find that, even when I trim as much excess as possible, this ends up being a fairly bulky finished fabric. Great for home furnishings, not bad for more structural garments like coats and doublets, perhaps not the best idea for something like a shirt. I can absolutely see why the Victorians defaulted to things like lap rugs and tea cozies. Before I get any deeper into the modern process, there's one part of the history we haven't covered, we've brought up the Japanese link a couple of times, and given it's, well, me, I have opinions. If you only care about the patchwork, skip ahead to the next chapter where I'll be talking about what I'm actually making. But for those of you still here, a brief history lesson. And when I say brief, I do mean incredibly brief. This period of history is ridiculously complex and it would take, well, it took six hours of lectures in an entire textbook to scratch the surface. That's what it took. This is not an exhaustive or even representative interpretation of history. This is just the bare minimum I feel is necessary to begin to explain what's going on here and how I feel about it. So, Portugal was the first European country to make contact with Japan in the 1540s and brought trade and, well, Christianity. A lot of Christianity. Within the next hundred years, there was significant political, social, and military upheaval within Japan, which led to the Tokugawa shogunate. This is a bit like calling this period the Regency. A shogun is kind of like a military regent, in this one specifically, Tokugawa Ieyasu was the first shogun of this period, and then it passed down his family line. For reference, there were other shogunates at other times in Japanese history, you do need to specify which one you're talking about. Anyway, foreign powers and Christianity were causing the Tokugawa shogunate a lot of problems, and also being blamed for even more problems that maybe weren't entirely their fault. So they closed the borders of Japan to foreigners. This was not complete. There were a couple of small islands that were still international ports. China got a pass on some stuff. There was a lot of smuggling happened. Also, Japan was not all of the territory it is now. But in general, no one left Japan. Nobody went in, trade was extremely limited, people around the world did not, broadly, see Japanese stuff or know anything about Japan. When they did, it was extremely rare and usually devoid of any context. For 264 years. In the early Victorian period, there were overtures to get Japan to open up to trade, subtext with the colonial powers of the West. And largely, Japan said no. So, the USA sent warships into Tokyo Harbor and threatened to open fire unless they said yes. What follows between this incident in 1853 and the removal of the Shogun in 1867 in Japan is called the Bakamatsu, and 
I cannot explain the back of Atsu to you in a 20 minute video about patchwork. I'm not even sure I'm qualified to explain the back of Atsu at all. It would be like trying to explain the French revolutions. All of the French revolutions. It's bloody and messy and in spite of what anime and historical dramas will tell you, nobody comes out of it particularly covered in glory. It's just important to note this was not a clean and universally positive transition. This was over a decade of fierce infighting, both political and literal, and a complete regime change that upended the established social order with the overarching threat of external forces. And I don't want to get too into the Meiji era that comes after this because that's also extremely nuanced and often gets somewhat misrepresented. Again, extremely disruptive and not the universally positive development it's often portrayed as. But what I can tell you about broadly is the effect this had on popular culture in Western Europe and colonial North America, and by extension why I'm a bit side-eye about the Japanese influence explanation for the origin of Crazy Patchwork. After 1867, not only was Japan trading with the West, they were trading as much as they could, and the Western world could not get enough of this. Prior to this point, Japan was semi-mythical in the public consciousness of Europe. It's the only country that gets mentioned by name in Gulliver's Travels. People in England literally thought of it as on par with talking horses and giants. And then when it was an actual place that you could trade with and maybe visit, that didn't really go away. Japan continued to be heavily mythologized and singled out as distinctly different from all other Asian countries for no real reason other than white people thought it was neat. And that's literally never gone away for reference. I'm not going to explain weeaboos here, but Google it. Also, all this stuff was new. If you were a wealthy enough white person, which wasn't even that wealthy because we stole stuff, including people's land and literal graves, your parents might have material heirlooms from Egypt and China. Your grandparents had heirlooms from Persia and India. Nobody had material goods from Japan. Nobody had seen Japanese art, Japanese pottery, Japanese textiles before. And it was rare because Japan had only just discovered that industrial revolutions were things you could have. And it was expensive because Japan actually managed to negotiate some pretty okay trade agreements and, you know, not get colonized. See above for the ridiculous pedestal Japan was put on and the Victorians adored novelty and exoticism, and this was new and different. But I think it's really important here to emphasize that the Victorians at large did not understand anything about Japan. Not really, and they didn't want to. They wanted to look at and ideally own the cool new things, and they were largely looking for things that fitted the narrative they already had, of Japan being exotic but also special, in some way different to other countries. I'm also not saying Japan didn't lean into this hard, they very much did, because it let them, you know, not get colonized. A great case in point is the Gilbert and Sullivan musical, The Mikado. I don't actually know if it's a musical or a comic opera or what. I hate musical theater. I need you to know that's my baseline. I don't resent musicals. I just don't like musicals. I don't get it. I respect other people like it. It's not that it's bad. It's just not for me. That's where you need to know I'm coming from before I tell you that I despise the Mikado with every fiber of my being. And I think it should never be performed and nobody should ever watch it. Absolutely none of the text or music is in any way representative of anything about Japan. It's offensively wrong. Don't get me started on the original set and staging, which wasn't offensively wrong. It was creepily accurate. There's a whole film about it. I watched the film. I hated the film. But that's what white people at that time wanted. They wanted the idea of Japan, the look of Japan. They did not care about the reality of Japan, except when it came to commodifiable objects. Obviously, Japanese material culture did make a difference in Western art. Collaboration breeds creation, 
Every artist knows this. It's impossible not to be inspired by the art you engage with. And when you see a new art from an entirely different tradition that you've never encountered before, of course it's going to show you things you haven't considered yet. But I do not think we should overlook the fact that some people were specifically looking to Japanese art as inspiration and ignoring the inspiration in other countries' art because Japan and Japanese things were already considered special and more worthy for reasons white people basically just made up. Japanese art isn't inherently more worthy or more inspiring than Chinese or Korean or Indian or Islamic or First Nations art. White people dismissed a lot of other sources of inspiration in order to focus on Japan. And anything new or innovative in the period might well be automatically linked to Japanese art because Japan was trendy and fashionable and you could piggyback onto that success. So finally, finally, bringing this back to the patchwork. When sources say that this patchwork was inspired by asymmetry in Japanese art or try and call it Japanese patchwork, we need to take that very skeptically and remember that actually that link is probably tenuous at best, if not completely fabricated. That was an extremely long tangent and I still haven't actually told you what I'm making. It's a wall hanging. I'm making a wall hanging. I made one or two of these as gifts at Christmas, so now it's time to make one for my house. The overall design and colour scheme actually came from a video game that my partner and I play a lot. It's called Stellaris. You get to design your own faction with a bunch of details and your own flag. The Martian flag we often use is a black planet rising against a field of red or orange. We're just fans of Mars in general, you know, in fiction, the MCRN did nothing wrong, and also in real life. My partner thinks it represents the sum of human endeavour and technological advancement. I cry over little robots just trying to do their best. All that good stuff. Once I've made all of the long strips, I sew them together and then make a pattern for what I want the rising planet to look like. That shape gets cut from a backing fabric and I'm now going to patchwork that too with the other main pattern that I use. With this design, you start from the centre and work outwards. This often ends up looking even more rich and textural than the strip method, rather like a Macintosh rose in fact, but I think it's a little more challenging because you have more edges and angles to be aware of. Because I'm only using plain solid black fabric for this, I'm trying to work in as many different textures and finishes as I can. But I should say that this design also looks incredible with, for example, two or three different colours. I'm trimming down the pattern by double the seam allowance I want to use, and then using that template to cut out the bottom of the hanging. 
Then I'm marking the seam allowance onto the back of the patchwork with a heat erasable pen so I can clip to that line and fold this back before laying it on top of the black section and top stitching it down. One thing I'm really enjoying about my patchwork projects has been using up waste fabric in an interesting way. I've historically been very against hanging on to little scraps of fabric for no reason. The number of people I know who've ended up with bin bags full of little pieces and no plan for what to do with them. And I think people are really unaware of how hard it is on your mental health to be surrounded by piles of rubbish. Hanging on to useless objects because they might come in handy one day genuinely has an impact on your space and your thoughts. But waste is waste. Aiming towards sustainability is always worthwhile as long as you're not sacrificing your health to do so, and this is such a joyful way of actually using those scraps. It appeals deeply to both my environmentally minded human self and my unplanned riot of colour chaos goblin self. The whole hanging then gets a backing and a bias binding edge, and it's ready to hang. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have a go at this style of patchwork, please do tag me on Instagram as I'd love to see it. In the description, there's a link to my Ko-fi page where you can leave a one-off or reoccurring donation to support the channel. Supporters get early access to my content and potentially more things in the very near future. If you like the look of this patchwork but don't think you'll be trying it yourself, keep an eye on my social media. Something a little bit exciting might be about to happen. I'll be back very soon with even more costuming and LARP related content. So dream big and I'll see you next time.